God is so good. Um, I'm excited to share the word with you today. And let me start off with a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for the privilege of standing before your people. And Lord, I recognize that uh, I'm standing here on your behalf. So, Lord, I submit my heart and my mind, my, my words, my mouth to you, that you would communicate what you feel is important for your people to hear. We thank you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So I'm starting a new series, and the title of that series is The Secret Life of Words. The Secret Life of Words. Now, for some people, that may resonate with you because you have young kids and you watch animated films like me, and you might be familiar with the film The Secret Life of Pets. Okay? And if you saw that film, that film is about what pets do when their owners aren't paying attention. How many of you have pets? You know, uh, I was listening to an NPR uh, broadcast, and there was a person that was doing some research, and they were saying at some point they had lost their dog, right? And, you know, their, their dog was out doing whatever the dog was doing. They eventually found the dog. But then the person was like, well, I wonder what my dog was doing all that time. Like, what if my dog has a whole life outside of what we do with the dog? Like, we have the things we do with the dog, but maybe the dog's life is beyond what I do. And so she did this whole thing, and she started, she wanted to find out how a dog thought, and so she started figuring out how they, you know, how they think about things, and she realized that dogs navigate their world through smell. And so, I, I mean, you know, she went through this process, but she just went through several days just smelling everything. And how does this smell? And how does that smell? And she learned a lot about how dogs think, you know, because they have a different life. I know that sounds a little gross, okay? But she was doing her research, and she learned so many things, right? Well, today, we're going to peer into the life The life of words. They have a secret life or secret to most people because they don't pay attention to what they do after the words are out there, right? So the secret life of words is a series about what words do when we aren't paying attention. Words continue to live Beyond the time they are spoken, heard, or thought. They continue to live beyond the time they are spoken, heard, or thought. And this subject gets into some really interesting subject matter. I'm, I'm teaching on this because of... I don't know how many weeks ago, we were, we were evaluating the words of a worship song, and I paused, and I, I said a little bit, and I was talking, and I, and I was trying to, de- we were talking about the, 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 the verse, declare and decree, right, and how it's used, and all those other kind of things, and so as I was thinking about it, I said, well, let me, let me teach on this so I can give you some understanding about how words work, and what I want to do is certainly, how can I say Especially in our contemporary world, there's a lot out there, a lot of YouTube videos, and people are talking and communicating, and, you know, we have a, 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 we have a history of being a, what people call a word of faith church, right? And so it's sort of like, how do you distinguish between biblical principles around words and between what is, for lack of a better term, the positive thinking arena around words and distinguish that between the new age thinking around words? Right? They're they're all three out there, and what happens, we hear a bunch of things, cliches, people talking, and all those kind of things, and they get lumped together. And so on the one hand, you have people who, because of that, they're just hesitant about any talk about this, because, like, I don't want to do no way stuff. So I don't want to hear messages about that. And then we have other people who are imprecise in how they're using it. They're just putting stuff here and there, and they're not being precise with the Scripture, Right? And so what we want to do is look at what the Scripture is saying about words so that we can live accordingly because the words do matter. It's not like they don't matter. They do matter, okay? So we're going to talk about that, okay? So one of the things we'll be doing, now this whole message is not about 
distinguishing between these popular understandings of the word of faith. But one of the things we will do is we will distinguish between the popular understanding of the word of faith message. When I say popular understanding, I mean televangelists, you know, the bling, the, the, the cliches, it, you know, the, what casual Christians say in passing. I want to distinguish between that and practitioners of the word of faith who apply its principles in a way where there's an overall pattern of results. Okay? So critics of this will often highlight their experiences. I did what you were talking about. Are you giving people false hope? And nothing happened, right? Then we'll talk about it. We, we all have stories like that, right? But on the other hand, there are communities of people who have lived this way, applied this idea, and I'm not saying that prayer is a magic wand and whatever you want will just happen the way you say every time. But what I'm saying is there are people who have an overall pattern of results to the point that they can, when they pray, pray with confident expectation. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So you, you, just like you can't ignore the times when things don't happen, you can't ignore the times when they do. So we're going to talk about, I happen to, my, my own feeling about this, I grew up in a community where there was an, where people lived this way, talked this way, and there was an overall pattern of results. I can't ignore that. This is particularly important. Now, this message is not about healing. At some point, we're going to do a series on healing. But I bring that up because it's interesting. When we have prayer requests for prayer meetings, like 80% of the requests have to do with health. People praying for healing. It's a pastoral issue. How do I have faith? Now, we all know how to go to the doctor. We all know how to take medicine. We all know how to take vitamins and that. We know about that. But how, does my, how do I involve my faith in the healing process? To do that, we have to get beyond the cliches. When people think about word of faith stuff, they think about bling bling. They think about like television and, and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. Most, for the people who get results, most of it is not that. It's not bling bling, it's blue collar, lunch bell, I'm going to work. It's, it's, it's so sober. <laughs> it, 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 it's not this exuberant thing, it's people being very clear about what the Word of God says and hanging on to the Word of God. I'm not going to get into all the details of that right now, but I'm just, I want to distinguish that, okay? So we're going to talk about some of those things. So to address it, we're going to go to Matthew 12, uh, 12, verse 33. And before we look at that verse, what I want to say is this. God definitely cares about how we speak. He cares about our words. And this passage is going to illustrate that, right? So just like the state judges parents on how they care for their children, right? You can't keep your kids from school. They, they do have truancy laws, <laughs> right? If your child commits a crime, they're coming for you. Right? If you abuse your children, they're coming for you. The, the, the state is judging you based upon how your children behave and act. As parents, you're accountable, right? So just like the state uh, judges parents on how they care for their children, God judges all of us on how we care for our words. Let me illustrate. Matthew 12, 33 says this. Either make the tree good and it's fruit good, or make the tree bad, and it's fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. This is Jesus talking, okay? You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, this is the key verse here, on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every, 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 every careless 
word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So I, I'm not going to be presumptuous about, how can I say? There's so many ways you can interpret this and consider this and stuff like that. I'm not going to be presumptuous about the, like, the way I think about it is the only way it can be thought about. But this is th- something we can conclude from this, right? God pays attention to what we say. So we should pay attention to what we say. Is that a fair interpretation? Like, can we at least say that? If God pays attention to what we say, we should pay attention to what we say. Is that fair? Okay. We're going to focus on that word careless, right? Careless words are not inconsequential. That's nothing we can draw a conclusion, right? Like he just said, every careless word you're going to hold account, you're going to be accountable for that on the day of judgment. So careless words are not inconsequential. Okay. We're going to look at the word careless, and I'm going to get a little nerdy today. We're going to look at the Greek. Okay. Okay, so that word careless is the Greek word argos. Okay. And I'm, I'm drawn from James Swanson Dictionary of Biblical Languages with Semantic Domains, Greek, and New Testament. Okay, and what I want to do is I'm I'm going to point. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today. I'm not going to go into depth into all of them, but I want to highlight some things. We're going to look at other places where this word argos is used in scripture, so we see all the inflection. So you know when you go when you look at a dictionary, uh, and you'll see multiple see first definition, second definition, third definition. What it's saying is like the word can be. When the word is used in this context, it has this connotation or this inflection. If it's used in this context, it can mean that. Okay, that's what we're about to do here. Okay, so the word argos. So the first inflection of it when we see careless is, and I'm quoting James Swanson here, not working. Okay, I'm going to call it unemployed, an unemployed word. Okay, so, so here's that same word is used in a different context here. So we're going to go to Matthew 20, verse 3. Okay, it says, And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle. In the marketplace, that's that word argos. Standing idle. So this was the parable where Jesus was talking about the people who needed work, and there was a person who owned some land, and he said, let me hire them. I'll hire you at 3 o'clock. I'll hire you at 4 o'clock. I'll hire you at 5 o'clock. But what he was saying is that there were some people, and we see people there today. They're outside, and they're waiting for work. They're just idle. That's that word argos. Okay, so one inflection is they're idle as in they're unemployed. They're unemployed. So what should we say about that? See, here's the thing. Our words have to be employed. If we just say the thing we're thinking and feeling without giving it any kind of assignment, it's like, and Marcy and I are doing this now, we're planning our summer because our kids are going to be out of school. You can't just, they can't just be out of school and we have no plan. We got to go through every single week and plan it in the hour. I mean, this, I mean it's not can't be so structured that they don't have any unstructured time. But, okay, swimming, piano lessons, they're going to be over here, they're going to be doing that. Because, listen, and parents know, if you don't give your kids structure, they're going to find something to do. It's not going to be what you want them to do. So you need to structure the activity of your words just like you structure the activity of your children. Think about the outcome you want. Think about the dynamic you want and then speak accordingly. You know, I was at an event not too long ago. And we were talking and, you know, it's interesting. People are interesting and they were just talking and some of them were talking and it's like, it's clear we have a difference of an opinion about some things. They, they, they probably think I agree with them, but I don't. And so it's like, what do I do? Do I say something to like, wait a minute, I don't think that's right or et cetera, or do I not say something? I chose not to say anything. So I was silent 
at the times where they were talking about things I didn't agree with. And then I talked at the times where there was agreement because I decided that I didn't want my relationship with them to be based on how we disagree. I mean, I could do that, but it's like the relationship is more important. This is not compromising my morality. It's just like we are different about this. We, this issue may come up at some point, and I may have to articulate something, but by that time, the Holy Spirit will have given me something that I can speak honestly about what I believe without being off-putting on the relationship. That was strategic. That, I wasn't just saying the first thing that came to my mind. I have to give my word structure. Give them things to do or they will find things to do. Here's another context for the same Greek word in another context. Borrowing from the, from the Greek dictionary here, I'm quoting, lazy or refuse to work as a lifestyle. So we'll just say lazy. Another context here. So here's, here's where that same Greek word is used in the, in, a, in the connotation is lazy. 1 Timothy 5.13, it says this. Besides that, they learn to be idlers. This is, the larger context of this is uh, uh, Paul is talking about um, young widows and, you know, they're out doing all kinds of stuff they shouldn't be doing, right? And so he's saying besides that, they learn to be idlers going about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. The connotation is lazy. They should be doing something else. But, in this, but, but see the thing, when, you're, when you call somebody and you say, what are you doing, nothing? It never actually means nothing. They're doing something. But they're doing something that's not productive. And what are they doing? They're busybodies, gossiping, getting people's business. Saying things they shouldn't. Lazy. We see it again. The same word is in Titus. Titus 1 and 12. This, this is a, the context for this is there are some criteria for elders that is being listed here. And Paul is contrasting between the criteria for elders. And we, he's basically saying we got to have these criteria because here, are, here is how some of the people are living that aren't good, right? And one of the areas in which they're living is they're lazy. So verse 12, it says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, okay? So here the word lazy. But you see the word lazy, but it's the same word argos used in Matthew 12, where it's talking about careless words, okay? So, let me draw this inflection out. We can't let our minds and mouths get lazy. We need to read social and spiritual context, like I indicated about the, cir the circumstance I was in with some folks, and I had to be, I couldn't just like talk casually because I just want to let my guard down and just let me just talk. Okay? And we need to maintain the discipline to either be silent Say something that suits the situation or avoid saying something inappropriate that we feel like saying at the moment. Requires discipline. I mean, I'll keep the parenting example. You know, that happens with your parent. Like, sometimes you don't feel like parenting. It's like you sit now, you just relax. It's after church. You know, this is a classic situation. After church, somebody in there hollering. I just got situated. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to deal with this. Or, or, or you say, listen, if you, I'm going to give you a warning. If you do this the third time, here's the consequence. You don't really want to do the consequence. You don't even feel like it, but then they do it. Or, or they mess up, and now the whole family activity, you can't do it because you got to discipline the one child. So you were looking forward to it. You can't do it because you got to discipline them. You don't feel like doing it but you got to. Same with our words. You feel like just, oh, man, I don't want to do all that. But guess who's watching? We're held accountable for every careless word. So what do we got? Unemployed, lazy. Here's another connotation, again, from the Greek dictionary. Quoting, useless, ineffective, not accomplishing anything, 
I just say I'm productive. So, first of all, that's the connotation in Matthew 12, 36. I'm not going to read that because we read that already. But also in James 2, 20, the same connotation. It says this, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? That's that Greek word, argos. Same Greek word. How about 2 Peter 1 and 8? It says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective. Ineffective is that Greek word, argos. Or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Question. Do your words produce life? Sometimes the scripture we use the language gives grace to the hearers. I'm not going to go deep into it right now, but we're going to address the concept of speaking things into existence. That's, the, that's one of those popular terms. And if you're, if, you, if, you, if you're thoughtful, you're like, okay, so what does that mean? Is that the Bible? Is that positive thinking? Is that new age? You're trying to work through that, right? Here's what I'll say. So we're going to explore the extent to which that concept is godly or biblical. I'm not going to go deep now. I'm just going to say we're going to address that. And we're going to look at the relationship between words, beliefs, and results, and we will distinguish between, as I said, biblical principles, positive thinking, and new age beliefs. Let me just say something about positive thinking. Positive thinking in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with it. It's right up there with vitamins and exercise. I mean, it can be good or bad. I mean, it's just, it's, it's neutral. Okay, there, there's nothing wrong with saying, thinking, goal setting, visualizing. We had Coach Joe up here a few weeks ago, I mean, months ago now, when we were doing the sports example, and he was saying as a basketball player, you're going to make the shot more often if you visualize making the shot first. Okay, so, so in and of itself, that's not wrong. What we want to do as Christians is always evaluate our motives. That's the issue. We talked about that two weeks ago when I was talking about, like, is, am I pursuing the heavenly vision or the American dream? Which one is it? So it's the motives more so than, so positive thinking. So some things, it may not be a chapter and verse on it. It could just be positive thinking. I'm going to say these things. There's a general benefit to thinking positive as opposed to thinking negative. So it's neutral, but it can be helpful. Okay, so this is a source of contention for many people because you have those who don't like to talk. Again, people don't like to talk about the subject because they don't want to be new age, and I, I respect that. I don't want to be new age either. I don't want to do that. We want to distinguish that, right? There are also those who have completely bought into the relationship between words and results, but who conflate biblical principles with positive thinking and the new age because... Again, cliches, televangelists, misinformed, or they're too lazy to be precise with scriptural passages in their context, which is where the decree and declare comes from. So at some point, we're going to talk about the context for that, for that verse so we can see where that's coming from, right? But this is, this is what we're bringing out. Okay, so what do we have? Word, Argos means what? Un- unemployed, lazy, unproductive, okay? And the last one here is... Quoting the, dictionary, the New Testament uh, Greek dictionary, indefinite or, or, I'm sorry, indifferent or careless. I'm going to say unintentional. And that's also another inflection from Matthew 12, 36. So I'm not going to repeat that verse because we've read it already. Okay. So, so here's what I say. Speak with a purpose. Be silent with a purpose. Speak with a purpose. Be silent with a purpose. I was talking to some person not too long ago, and, you know, some people just ask stuff they don't have to say. It's like, he's like, I don't know what God's going to do. Maybe I'll get hit by a car. Why would you say something like that? I mean, you hear people like that. They're just casually talking. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to say things like that. Why add that to my thinking? And like, no. But there are people who are just saying things without a purpose because it's, they, it's an awkward silence or they're trying to relate to people, they're trying to connect. It's just, you know what, let it be awkward. As they say, you don't have anything good to say? It's better. It's better to be quiet. People are going to think you're smart if you're quiet. You, you might not know anything, but just by being quiet, 
They're going to think you're smart. And the thing is, you will become smart. Because at that other event I was at, you know, you just watch, you listen to everybody else talk. It's like, okay, 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 okay. Note it. <laughs> Note it. And then, and, then, and then you speak when you need to. And then people have respect for you. Because when they have to make a decision, they're going to come to the quiet people. Because they know the quiet people don't gossip. <laughs> They ain't saying a whole lot. They know a lot because they watching. Okay, so let's get into this, right? Why does God care about our words? Two reasons. The first reason is words govern, govern multiple aspects of our lives. Multiple aspects of our lives. So what I'm going to do, there's a lot of scriptures. I'm just going to read them. I'm not going to expound on them. I'm just going to be giving you some examples of all these places where the Bible's talking about words. And I'm not going to talk about their context because they are in different contexts. I'm not, this is not the time to get into the context, but just to show you there's a lot of conversation about words. So we're just, we're just going to go through them, okay? Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 5, 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which, it, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Mark eleven twenty three, 23. Truly I say to you, whoever says to, the, to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be, and we talked about triple threat, right? Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. 2 Corinthians 4.13, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak. Philippians 4.6, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer, words, <laughs> and supplication, words, with thanksgiving, words, <laughs> you know, and let your request, words, be made known to God. It's all words. And uh, I, I'm going I'm to I'm cheat a little bit before, I'm going to say a little bit uh, before I get to this other part of the series, but worry is words too. Anxiety, words. Psalms 102, 107, verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. Whom he has redeemed from trouble. Got to talk about it. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. These next are, are just a bunch of Proverbs, but they ring so true. Uh, Proverbs 15, 4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 18.21, this is a popular one. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Proverbs 21.23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Proverbs 12.25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Proverbs 10.19, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. I'm thinking of a person right now, but I'm going to leave it there. This is, this is another event I was at, and they just, they just speak their mind, whatever comes to their mind. And they're just thrusting people. They don't know. They don't know who else is in the room, who's hearing it. So there's one who, whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings what? Healing. But to do that, you have to be intentional about how you use your words. Proverbs 18, 13, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs eleven thirteen: whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. We can go on, but I, you, you, you get a sense. Like, words are all over the place. This is one reason why God cares, because it covers so many parts of our lives. 
Here's the second reason. Okay. We represent the state. I'm going to explain this to you, but I want you to just hold that in your mind. God cares about our words because we represent the state. What do you mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this, verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20 is the kicker here. Therefore, we are, what? Ambassadors for Christ. That's not a metaphor. That's real talk. You know what an ambassador is? They're sent from one country to another to speak on behalf of the state. The next part of it says, God making his appeal through us. A lot of people say, well, you can't say that because God said it. If God said it, you can't say it. If you're an ambassador, whatever the king says, you say. Ever heard of a press secretary? Press secretary, you're not the president. I represent him. Right? And that press secretary has to say whatever the president says, even if their opinion is different. You know, Condoleezza Rice, after she was no longer in office, you know, she served under uh, the second President Bush, right? And she was, she was interviewed and she said, you know what, I have a different opinion on abortion than he does. But she didn't share that while she was Secretary of State. Secretary of State, her position of abortion is the president's position on abortion. Now, when she's no longer in that position, she can say whatever she wants. But as long as she is, the Secretary of State basically is the chief ambassador. She had to say whatever the president says. You ever seen uh, Coming to America? Yeah. Remember the barbershop scene? Some of you, you're going to have to watch the movie to see it, but it was a line that says, hey, mama name is Clay? I call him Clay. That's how we got to be with God. Daddy name is healing. I call it healing. Is his name Jehovah Rapha? Daddy name is provision. I call it provision. Is God Jehovah Jireh? Daddy call him Abraham. I call him Abraham. We say what he says. Not because we him but because we represent the state. And if an ambassador says something that's out of line with the state, they will be judged. We are ambassadors. As ambassadors, our words reflect or should reflect the law, policy, position, and status of our home country. As ambassadors, our thinking and our speaking should reflect where our citizenship resides. What does it say in Philippians 3.20? But our citizenship is in where? Heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our citizenship is. Do you know if you're an ambassador, if, if, let's say I'm an American ambassador, and I'm in, say, Colombia. Let's say, let's say Colombia has a famine. The ambassador's not going to starve. All their food has to be imported from America to there. They are not reliant on the ecosystem or the economy of the state they reside in. They're dependent on the ecosystem or the economy of the state where they're a citizen. Y'all poor. I'm not poor. (laughs) 
I have whatever the state has. Now, you can live in that country, and again, everything around you could be terrible. But your country has to protect you, got to feed you, got to do all this stuff. Because, like, what kind of country sends you on an assignment and doesn't give you the resources to fulfill the assignment? Our personal status is always the status of our citizenship, not our residence. Matthew 6, 19 through 20, what does it say? It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, residence, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where our citizenship is where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's why we have to be about the heavenly vision. Now, you may be on something that God didn't assign you to do. You're on your own. You got to fund that. But if you're, doing, if you're doing what God told you to do, he has to resource you for that. This is why we're commanded not to worry and to keep our focus on the business of the, of the state. We all know this, Matthew 6, 31 through 33, it says, Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The Gentiles are the folks who live, their citizenship is the residence that you're in. They got to figure that out. But our citizenship is in heaven. So what does it say, verse 33? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the things will be added to you. If you're an ambassador, you got health insurance, you got security detail, you got housing, you got transportation, you got financial provision. Your home country has to take care of you. And they do that so you don't have to be worried about paying your light bill because why are you worrying about that? when you've got to do kingdom business. Now, I'm not saying things don't happen in this life. Look, if you're an ambassador to Colombia and Colombia has an earthquake, you're going to get under the table too. If they have a flood, you're going to experience that too. I'm not saying those things don't happen, but what I'm saying, you're resourced from a different place to respond to issues of crisis. It rains on the just and the unjust alike. What I'm saying, people who don't know God, their only resource is the residents of earth. People who know God, they have a resource. And all I'm saying is, the king says, what we say has to match the king, regardless of what the status is of the residents. Okay, so let me be clear. This is not denying reality. When you go to the doctor, you got to tell the doctor what's going on, otherwise, why are you there? If you go to a financial advisor, you got to tell the financial advisor what your problems are, otherwise, why are we talking? If you have a, a, a personal trainer, they got they to know. So I'm not saying you can't talk about what's happening on the earth. I'm just saying your faith and your belief and your trust is in heaven. And if it's in there in abundance, it's just going to come out of your mouth. That's a subject for another day. But I just wanted to lay the context that we need to be careful for how we speak. Now, what do I want to say? Before I close, I just want to say a few things. So what I'm not going to do is this is not a message that's going to shame people for not getting a result. We're, we're going to have a, a, a in part of this series, I'm going to talk about kind of like, I mean, faith is always key, um, but th that's, sometimes that, w when something doesn't happen the way we prefer, it's easy to say, oh, that person didn't have enough faith. There are a lot of variables that affect an outcome, okay? So I don't want to oversimplify this message and just say, the result didn't happen, so it must mean this. I don't want to oversimplify, 
but I also don't want to negate principles of faith that we have to come to terms with as well. Okay, so I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to reduce all of our lives and all of Christian thinking to, like, it's all about, what I'm not going to do is equate godliness to material blessing. I'm not going to do that either. Like, so, so you, must be, you, you must be close to God because you're wealthy and you're healthy and this and that. Because as I said a couple of weeks ago, that might be true about you and you might be far from God. You might not be in a position where you're materially uh, 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 prospering, but you might be very close to God. So I don't, I don't want to conflate that either. We're going to deal with these principles. We're just not going to go into the extremes. Does that make sense? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Father God, we thank you, Lord, for uh, just this opportunity to just be clear about what you're saying to us. We want our mouths to reflect what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you have for us. Um, We want to align ourselves with you. Lord, you do say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto us. Help us to have a heart for the kingdom. Help us to have a heart for your priorities, for your ways of being and doing right. Lord, we trust you and we love you. There may be some of you here this morning and you recognize that your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. Maybe you've never had a solid relationship with God. And like many people, you're just around Christian contexts. But you know you actually haven't committed to Jesus seriously. Or maybe you have been faithful at one time, but you've fallen away. You, again, you could be a person who's kind of around Christian context, but you're, you're, the seriousness, the fire, the priority of the Lord, they're just not in your heart, and you want to recommit. If, if it's either of those things, I want to pray with you, and I want to invite you to say a prayer with me. Now, you'll be repeating after me if you do this. Simply repeating after me, that's nothing. If your heart isn't also saying, I want more of Jesus. I want to commit to Jesus. If in your heart you're actually saying that, you're actually believing that, then when you repeat after me, that has power. There's something uh, transformational that's going to happen on the inside of you. So that's you, whether you're on site or you're online, I just want you to repeat after me if you want to draw closer to Jesus. Dear God, I come to you now. I recognize that either I've sinned or I am a sinner. And I need the salvation that only comes from you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe that he shed his blood, that he died that he was buried, and then he was resurrected. And that in his resurrection, he gave me the power to live a righteous life. Holy Spirit, fill me with you. Fill me, Holy Spirit, that I can continue to live a righteous life and a holy life. I submit to Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, I would like for you to text Zoe Save to the number on your screen. This gives us an opportunity to follow up with you, connect with you, um, and to connect you with other people who've lived your life or, or right in the journey you are you're all right now. Okay, so please text that so we can follow up with you. Secondly, as you were praying that, there may be some of you who experienced speaking a supernatural language. In fact, some of you heard an example of that early this morning in worship, and you may have found yourself saying that. Um, That happens sometimes when we come to Jesus. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it should be embraced. So I encourage you with that. And there may be some of you who desire that gift, and it's biblical to desire spiritual gifts. And if that's the case, I encourage you to, to continue to desire and pray for spiritual gifts. Finally, there may be some of you out here today who are discerning whether or not you want this church to be your uh, local community of Christians and believers. If that's the case, 
Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to ask some questions, to, to, to get some clarity on our mission, our vision, to talk to me, actually. And so if that's the case, I want you to text Zoe member to the number of your screen. That text is not a commitment. It's simply alerting us to your interest, and we'll be contacting you about how you can get further information. Amen? It has been a blessing to be before you today.